Cool, brilliant. Hello everyone, my name is Chris Cooper, or find me on Twitter at Mobility Cooper. And I'm going to talk to you about a thing called a smart intelligent self. But before we go any further, um, I'm going to use the term smart city, smart communities. They're interchangeable. But first, a show of hands. Um, who knows what a smart community is or could be? That's a really good start. That's no hands. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, the institution that I belong to, the Institute of Engineering and Technology, about three years ago did a survey of random people and said, have you heard of the term smart city? Smart city, smart community, one and the same. And a lot of people said, yes, I have. And the top answer, at 30% of the votes, it's where the students hung out. So, because obviously students are smart. Now, I was a student and I don't think I was particularly smart, so you call that an oxymoron. The second place, with another good hefties, tens of percent, is where the best dressed people are. Now, that does make sense, doesn't it? Smart place, best dressed people, absolutely. Um, way down in the weeds of the one percenters, and this is how good our industry has been plugging smart cities, and I've been doing it for about 15 years, so, um, is that it's actually where you can use and harness information to go and do something better than if you didn't have the information. So this is go, what does that mean? What does better mean? Well, it depends on what you want your information to do. Do you want it to improve your sustainability? Do you want to improve your operational efficiency? Do you want to reduce headcount? Do you want to reduce risk? Do you want to prove to your bank that you're doing a good thing? Do you want to prove to your mother-in-law that you're not having an affair? You can use data <laughs> however you want but you've got to use it in a smart way. And the thing that my industry gets really excited about is selling technology. I'm a technologist, you know, I come from a technology company. Um, actually, it's a really more pragmatic thing. It's not about technology per se, it has an important part, but it's also about people and process. So why do people do things? And how can they do something different to take advantage of this information that's coming to us? <coughs> So introducing a smart intelligent self. I'm gonna give you a heads up, I'm asking for some money. So start preparing those wallets, get your fivers out, or actually anything with folding and do, but a fiver is a good start. So right at the end, I am gonna ask some money and introduce a couple of other people as well on the way, but I'm gonna take you on a journey. And we're gonna start off, I kind of gave a pricey of it in the, in the magazine. Uh, who thinks we are smart in the South? And, and that's the right answer, the same as the last one. We are not smart, by the way. So. <laughs> I'm going to take you on a journey, and we're going to talk about this place. Very proud of this place. I'm from here. Um, beautiful place. Probably one of the best places in the world to live, I would argue. And yet, we're not very smart about it, are we? We pollute our rivers, pollute our harbours. Uh, we don't take advantage of our natural resources. You might have heard my good friend Backer talking about that this morning. Um, we need to be better at managing our natural environment. So. The, the other thing, so the, the first thing is, is that, you know, how do we do that? And we can do that through improved connectivity, improved use of the data. But our Solent area has got some fantastic natural, physical, geographic, environmental, economic um, opportunities and assets that aren't available in other places in the world. We're very lucky. So we need to do something about how do we... If we are going to use data and information, how do we turn it into something smart? Remember, it's all about how do we use that information to do something better? So we need to change the narrative of the conversation. But this big diamond at the bottom often gets lambasted. Oh, they're in the 1950s, they're in the 18th century. Dudes, wake up. They are ahead of the game. They're on gigabit fibre to the door, fibre to the premises, that nirvana. They've scooted around the uselessness of open reach and its copper cable, and they're giving direct fiber optic cable to every premise and business on the Isle of Wight. Yes, people in the Isle of Wight are complaining that they can only go 12 miles an hour instead of 14 miles an hour around the island because of the roadworks, but quite frankly, they are going to be ahead of the game of the rest of the region because they're going to have really fast connectivity. What does that mean? <laughs> Well, apart from getting Netflix better, um, <laughs> it's going to open up a whole round of new opportunity in sending data, collecting data, storing data. Uh, and that allows us to do more with information. And we can, if we do more with information, we can then make the place a little bit better. So my first call to making um, the South a bit better is, can we follow the Isle of Wight rather than the Isle of Wight following us and get that gigabit connectivity? 
This means all of you talking to your local councillors, your MP, your Open Reach, your Virgin Media, and going, can I have gigabit, please? Because the Isle of Wight have got it, and they're 30 years behind us. Why are they now 30 years ahead of us? It's a bit of consumer pressure. Start talking to your telco and getting that gigabit broadband set up. Um, <coughs> the thing is, is that the industry will go, oh, yeah, yeah, but we've got 5G coming. Well, 5G is really good. It's got a short radio wave. Um, doesn't penetrate concrete too well. It's great for some things, not great for a lot of things, and it still needs a very fast fibre backhaul. So even if you've got 5G, push back and say, yeah, but I still want a nice big fat fibre connection to take that gorgeous data to where it needs to go and be useful. Ah, the SDGs. Um, <clears throat> who's heard of COP26? Hands up, everyone. Yeah. All right, this is the audience interaction bit after lunch. You're supposed to do this. Right. Um, <laughs> this model, um, quote uh, from Jenka Lorenz and the Zoe. So the SDGs are sustainable development goals. And my other call to action for the South to become smarter and more intelligent is that we've got to start having a conversation about numbers. What do we want our place? What do we want Southampton, Eastleigh, Portsmouth, Gosport to be famous for? What do we need it to be on these SDGs? Why should we use SDGs? Well, everyone is using the same reference point to say, my water quality is this. And we've already had the argument in an international standards body as to what good water quality is. So if you can say to your electorate and your, your, your populace, I've got clean water because it's as per the sustainable development goal, then that's a big tick in the box for you. And it means that you can start crowing about your water quality. I don't know whether you've been in our harbours recently, but there's a bit of a pong going on. We wouldn't pass an SDG on clean water in our harbours and we're a first world nation. Isn't that a bit shocking? So we need to have that conversation about what is good like? What are those outcomes? How do we measure them? What outcomes am I looking to achieve vis-a-vis -vis better water quality? And we can use the SDGs because people can compare and contrast the numbers known, the metrics known. There's no, oh, do we use kilometres or miles? Well, you use kilometres because the rest of the world does. Sorry, Americans, you've lost that battle. But <laughs> we can start recognising, <coughs> pardon me, that in our SDGs we have different stratas. We've got biosphere, we've got society, we've got economy, we've also got us. And, and this is really important for a, another piece that I'll, I'll introduce in a bit um, from Kate Raworth on donor economics. But understanding your number and then having a debate around what is your number for your place is where we need to go next. And how does this link to our fibre? Well, the fibre helps collect and connect information. Um, it's just another part of the thing. That's your infrastructure piece. Now, this, now we're looking into the, the numbers piece, the application side of our digital technical stack. Um, and what we're going to go on to next is a very exciting topic, and it's called governance. Now, this is where you can fall asleep after lunch and I'll make it very quick. Um, <coughs> there's a book called Against a Smart City. I recommend you read it. Um, we've also seen in science fiction plenty of overviews of a dystopian future of Big Brother watching over you. Um, I'm not going to lie. I think we could slip into certain areas where we are the product. Oh, we're here already, aren't we? Facebook milking us for millions, billions. Um, we need to get a grip on who we are and what is our purpose in a digital world. To take advantage of a digital world, we've got to give a little bit of context of us up, who we are, where we are, what we want to do. My argument is we need to decide. And luckily, um, it's a complete blatant plug for one of our products. None of you will need to buy, by the way. But what the point here is is saying that through clever people, help with the University of Southampton, backer, thank you, <laughs> um, We've got the technology, the engineering exists to give us choice and control as to what we do with our personal data. So the other call, alongside talking about the numbers, alongside getting our broadband is, can you politicians and you businesses make sure that my personal data is contained, controlled by me and I understand how to do it? And if we have that push and that ask, the market will respond because the engineering is already there that will deliver it. So why do we need to do this? 
Well, <laughs> there's some real fundamental issues happening. I'll give you this one. Oh my God, yeah, the, look, the idea of this slide is it's supposed to focus your brains uh, on these no entry pieces, because the, quite frankly, the words are too small. Uh, this chart is from an organization called UK Fires. It's an, uh, a consortium of uh, the UK's leading universities. And they basically came up with a plan that said, if you want to seriously get down to net zero for 2050, you need to do a bunch of interventions that aren't going to be politically popular. Hmm. Let's take flying, for example. Uh, for those at the back, it just says by 2030 to 2049, to get net zero, all airports will close. Yeah, but that's going to happen, isn't it? The object of the exercise is to say, you've got some challenging decisions to make. You need data to help make those decisions. Now can you see why we need to have that conversation around what is smart, what are we going to do about it? <coughs> the other thing that's influencing my perspective is um, an economist, Kate Raworth, who's really struggling to think about why we've got this constant growth demand. And she came up with a concept called donor economics, and it's been tested in places like Amsterdam. And a key bit is recognizing that there's this ecological ceiling, how much natural resource we have in our planet. That's on the outside. We've got a social foundation. What do we actually need to live? Those minimum requirements, air, shelter, water, food. And then we've got the bit in the middle where the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, or our society moves along nicely. And, and how we live within that boundary is where the action happens. So if we want to make a change in making more things efficient or sustainable, we have to work in within that, that, that boundary of the donor. And that's where you use data and proof points and outcomes to prove that you've done, done the right thing. Uh, but recommend that as a read. Um, the other thing that we need to focus on is that creating data is all well and good, but you tend to create more than you need. So we've got to get really smart on getting rid of data. So what this project, what this diagram is trying to show is that over time you collect more and more data, which is the green line, and the value of that data, as it gets to a point where it's going to be used, becomes ever more valuable and notionally has a, has a high value impact. Uh, but once it's acted upon, that data has no value in itself because you don't need it. You've already, so you can get rid of it. Do you know what engineers like to do? Ah, can I keep it? Just in case. Yeah, but you've already acted on it. Yeah, yeah, but just in case. I never know I might need it. We, we're awful at hoarding things. Uh, ask my wife. I've still got bits of wood from 20 years ago. But the thing is with understanding when you can get rid of data means that you can remove it off your servers. You can get it off your business books. It reduces your risk, reduces cost. So the key thing to do about being smart, get rid of your data. And there's te different techniques that we can help you with to get there. But the key thing for me is recognizing where data has value. And that data has value if you can do something with it. So again, it's not about technology, it's about people process. If I've got a new bit of data, what am I gonna do with it? Can I do something? Is it gonna improve my bottom line? Make my property more expensive, more valuable? Increase my yield? Those are the kind of things you need to think about your data. If it doesn't, don't process it, don't use it, don't store it, get rid of it. And then the end end goal. Who's heard of digital twins? One or two hands? Yay. All right, that's marketing, by the way. <laughs> I, the tech industry loves a good bit of marketing, and digital twins are yet more marketing. But they do kind of have a point. And a digital twin, for those that don't know, are Digital replicas are something that is already there, and you can use them for two things. You can do a real-time rendering, so you're just displaying what's happening. Google Maps is kind of a digital twin of what's going on in the traffic. It's about a 10 minute delay. Don't know whether you noticed, but it's, it's kind of getting there. You then also have predictive digital twins, so what if scenario planning. So what if I pull, close this road, or I shut down this door, what would happen in an evacuation procedure? You can have a digital twin to do that. Where the industry is predicting, though, and why I've highlighted it in the big red circle, is we get to, what do they call it? Autonomous operations and maintenance. Yes, Skynet is born, for those Terminator references. Um, what does that mean? It means that your digital twin is making autonomous decisions, i.e. it's making decisions by itself, based on the data coming in and the scenario that it thinks it's going to happen, and it makes an intervention without any human in 
any human input. Uh, the human might go, oh, that was a good idea, we'll do that again next time, or maybe that was a little bit over the egg, egging it, we'll just wind it back a bit. We have a completely different relationship with our assets, with our data, and with what does good look like. We are miles away from reaching level five. In reality, in digital twin land, we're somewhere between naught and one. So that is, we're struggling to capture reality, and we're now just about putting in some um, data onto some maps and doing something useful. You could argue a Tesla is now hitting three and four with the way it can do self-driving. Yes, a Tesla could be a digital twin. Um, but realistically, the end end goal is that we're using data to do differences, taking outcomes, using our standard measures, using our great connectivity, and changing the narrative as to what we want to do. And a twin is just another way of telling a story. So, now comes the money bit. To help realize this, myself and the Southern Policy Center, um, which is led by John Denham and Simon Eden, um, the Southern Policy Center is politically independent. It's there to advise the South on policy what to do. Um, we're in the process of writing a paper to convince our local leadership and stakeholders that we need to embark on a joined up uh, journey to become a smarter intelligent South. If you'd like to participate in that paper in terms of use cases, um, and help with marketing, or even put in a few quid, folding money only though, uh, to help write it, that'd be great, it's fully received. But if you've got any questions on smart communities, digital twins, a smart intelligent self, please give me a shout and get in touch with Mob at Mobility Cooper on LinkedIn. Thank you very much. Take care. <laughs>